All right, so the last thing that I'm going to be covering with you is tips for dealing with specific types of religions that you're going to run into when you're out souling. Now, let me just start out by saying this, though. You don't need to know any of these tips to go soul winning. You don't want to get this attitude that says, oh man, I got to know how to deal with all these special situations. The same gospel works for everybody. I mean, everybody needs to know they're a sinner. Everybody needs to know the wages of sin is death. Everybody needs to know salvation is by faith alone in Christ. And if you think about what all false religions have in common, they all teach a works-based salvation. So if your gospel presentation is primarily about teaching people that it's not by works and teaching people that you can't lose your salvation, well, that's exactly what every false religion needs to hear. I mean, name for me the false religion that doesn't have that wrong. I mean, are the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, are any of them teaching eternal security of the believer? None of them are. So the gospel presentation that's the basic plan of salvation can be used on anyone. And so I want to just make that clear going in. And I also want to say this. Often new believers can be a better soul winner than someone who is very knowledgeable about the Bible because of the fact that the guy that's very knowledgeable about the Bible can sometimes be tempted to go off on rabbit trails yeah. Yeah. because he wants to really take these people to task. Yeah. You know, because when you're out soul winning and you know the Bible real well, you know that the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, man, you can chew them up and spit them out. Right. But here's the thing. Is that going to get them saved? No, no. no. that's not going to get anybody saved. And you'll spend your time just showing how smart you are for an hour, hour and a half, when down the street there's somebody who needs to be saved, but you're too busy fooling around with somebody who just wants to argue. So sometimes new believers can even do a better job because since they don't know the answer, they'll say, hey, let's get back to that. But, you know, back to what I was saying. And they'll keep it on point and actually stay on the right subject. So I just want to make that clear going in. But... That being said, there are some specific tips that can come in handy when dealing with certain religions when you're out soul winning. Just things that I've learned over the years that will make you a little bit more effective. Now, I want to say this also, that all of the tips that I'm going to give you, these are actually tips that I've seen work. I'm not getting up here and just telling you some theoretical. And there are a lot of people who get up and tell you all about how to do X, Y, and Z when they've never done it before. And so I don't want to be that guy. And just to give you an example of that, people always want me to do a demonstration on how to win Mormons to Christ. Well, here's the problem with that. I've won very few Mormons to Christ. I do not consider myself a successful winner of Mormons to the Lord. So I'm not going to get up and say, all right, everybody, let me tell you how to win the Mormons to the Lord. When it's something that I've failed at and something that I have done a poor job at, I'm not going to get up and tell you how to do it. The stuff I'm going to tell you in the next few moments are things that I've used and they work. So I'm not up here just telling you how to fail. I'm telling you how to succeed. So let's start out with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. When I knock on the door of a Jehovah's Witness, there are some things that I do a little bit differently. You don't have to do this, but this is just a little bit better way of doing it and I'll explain why. You say, well, how do you know they're a Jehovah's Witness? Well, a lot of times they'll have something on the porch, a little sticker or a little decal for JW.org. I've seen that a lot. But when you ask them, do you go to church anywhere? That's kind of a good way to figure out where they're at. When you say, so are you Christian? Do you go to church anywhere? And then they'll tell you, I go to the Kingdom Hall. Well, if you hear the words Kingdom Hall... That's Jehovah's Witness because the Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones who use the term Kingdom Hall. Or they might just tell you, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So if I deal with the Jehovah's Witnesses, here's the one thing I do different. Instead of asking them, do you know for sure if you died today you go to heaven? Instead of that, I ask them, do you know for sure if you died today that you're saved and that you have eternal life? Now you say, why the change? Because if you ask them, do you know for sure you, if you die today, you go to heaven? Here's what they'll say. Oh, well, I'm not going to heaven because there's only 144,000 going to heaven. And then you're already on a rabbit trail. 
And after just so many doors of just over and over again having them say, well, I don't want to go to heaven. You know, I'm not trying to go to heaven. It's, you know, that's for the 144,000. We're going to be on this earth and blah, 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 blah. I just decided, you know, I'm sick of the conversation being derailed before it even starts. Yeah. So the way I bypass that is by saying, do you know for sure that you're saved? Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? Okay. That way I can get into the gospel that I want to preach and not get off on something else. Now, with all cults in general, any kind of a cult or people who have strange beliefs, including the Jehovah's Witnesses, including the Mormons, but like I said, I haven't had a lot of success on that front, other cults, and any false religion in general, my goal is to deal with specific heresies at the end. I don't want to just start out the conversation attacking their religion, start out the conversation tearing down these heresies that they have. I want to get the gospel out there because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to, the Jew, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I want to get the gospel out there. That's where the power is. The message that is going to pierce them and that's going to cut them to the heart is that message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what everybody needs to hear. So I want to get through my whole gospel presentation before I start dealing with specific things. So that's why at the beginning of the conversation, I don't want to let them get me off on a rabbit trail. Uh, you know, uh, turn to Psalm 83, you know, and they, they want to turn you here and turn you there and, and get you talking about Saturday is the day when we should be going to church or the name of God is Jehovah. Just all these different things that they want to get you talking about. I want to try to save those things for the end and get the gospel out there. Okay. Now, here's another tip for dealing with people that are very steeped in these false religions. If they take over the conversation, walk away. If they take over the conversation, walk away. If it gets to the point where they're preaching to me and they're teaching me and they're running the conversation, then at that point, I just smile and say, hey, listen, we got to get going. Have a great day. See you later. And I walk away. I'm not, and you say, why is that? Well, because of the fact that I don't believe it's right. I don't even believe that the Lord wants me to sit and have some phony preach lies to me. You know, if I know they're a false prophet, I know they're a false teacher, I shouldn't just sit and listen to them. And that conversation's going nowhere when they're doing 80 to 90% of the talking. You know, if I show up at the door, I'm there to preach to them. And if they want to turn it around and preach to me, see ya, I'm out of there. I got, you know, I got better things to do. I didn't come to be preached to by heretics. I came to win people to Christ. I'm going down the street. I'm going to find somebody else. And I've often had these people try to follow me. Wait, wait, I'm not done with you yet. And I'm like, bye, see you later. You know, get out of there, right? Don't waste time. Okay, so that's with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, at the end, so at the beginning, I just say, are you 100% sure that you're saved? Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? And then I roll into my normal gospel presentation. But then when I get to the end, though, if I can get them to see that salvation is by faith and that you cannot lose your salvation, if I can get them to see those two things, I can always get them to believe the Trinity. Why? Because most of your Jehovah, the Jehovah's Witnesses that aren't going to get saved, you won't get them to see that it's all by faith and you won't get them to see the eternal security part. You will lose them. If they're, if they're rejecting the gospel, you'll lose them on those two points. Every single person that I've ever been able to get to agree that it's by faith and agree that you cannot lose your salvation, then here's what I say to them next. I say, if I could prove to you from the Bible that Jesus is God, would you believe in it if I could prove it to you from the Bible? They'll say yes. And then I show them from the Bible. And if I already convince them that they're wrong about salvation and wrong about eternal life, they'll always when they see it, embrace the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus Christ is deity, that he is co-eternal with God the Father. Because, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is a created being. They believe that he is like a lesser God, 
That's why it says in John 1, 1 in their fake Bible, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. They believe Jesus is a God, a lesser God, a created being, Michael the archangel. They do not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Well, the Bible says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so uh, just a few verses that I cover with them at the end on the divinity of Jesus Christ, I like to use 1 Timothy 3.16. I like to use Hebrews 1.8. I like to use Isaiah 9.6. And I also like to go to Mark chapter 10 where he says, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. And the reason I like that one is that that's one that Jehovah's Witnesses are actually taught to use to say that he's not God. So uh, sometimes I even pull that one out first. I say, well, here, let me prove to you that Jesus is God. And I'll whip open my Bible, and I'll take them there, you know. Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. And they say, well, exactly. Yeah, you know. And I say, well, let me ask you, is Jesus good? Well, of course. Well, why are you calling him good? There's none good but one, and that's God. So you have either, either of two choices. Either he's God or he's not good. Are you going to sit here and tell me that Jesus isn't good? I mean, come on. So, you know, that's a pretty powerful one. And then obviously Hebrews 1.8 is crystal clear. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, Isaiah 9.6. And there, you know, you, there are all manner of places you could take them. You know, I like the, the scripture in Hebrews chapter 3 where it talks about how this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses... Inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that builds all things is God. God's the creator, and Jesus Christ is unto Moses as the builder of the house is to the house itself. Jesus is God. He's called God in Hebrews chapter 3. So, I mean, there are a lot of places. The one place that I don't take them is I don't take them to 1 John 5, 7, and I don't take them to John chapter 1. And the reason why I don't take them to those two places is because those two places are what they're indoctrinated to be able to counter. You know, they've heard their whole life, oh, yeah, people are going to try to tell you that Jesus is God. They're going to take you to John 1 and 1 John 5, 7. And so they're already kind of inoculated against those verses. So by using verses other than those, you're, you're hitting them with something fresh. You're hitting them with something new. But like I said, if you can already get them to reject the Watchtower's teaching on salvation by works, you know, getting them to see the divinity of Jesus Christ is an easy victory at the end of that conversation. And I've successfully led several Jehovah's Witnesses to the Lord. I've even had some of them baptized. And so, uh, you know, this has been a, a successful method in dealing with them. And also when you're dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, make sure that you emphasize the bodily resurrection of Jesus because they've been taught a, a fake resurrection, quote unquote, about how Jesus' spirit simply left his body. So what I do is just while I'm presenting the gospel, when I get on the point of the resurrection, I, I really make a point about how he showed him the holes in his hands and sighed and that he was physically bodily there. He ate and drank with them. And if they balk at that, I just take them to Luke 24 and, and show them that, okay? So these are some tips for dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses. And again, don't let this intimidate you if you're a new soul winner. Like, oh, I got to know all this. No, you don't. Because you could, I, I'm talking to the more advanced crowd right now. And who here would consider yourself an experienced soul winner? Put up your hand. That's who I'm talking to in this session. I'm talking to the experienced. Those of you that are beginners, just get out there and, and give them the basic plan of salvation and if they don't like it, then they can sit on attack and go to the next door and don't worry about it. And, and don't have this attitude, oh, man, you know, because I messed up, now they're not being saved. Well, what if you hadn't have shown up, they certainly wouldn't have gotten it. You know what I mean? Just do your best. Just get out there and do your best. Even if you, even if you mix things up, if you're preaching the King James Bible and if you're preaching a true gospel, even if you do a bad job, hey, it, it, it's sort of like pizza, you know, even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. Amen? <laughs> you know what I mean? So just, just do, do your best. As long as you're not teaching lies, you're not hurting anybody. Now, obviously, go as a silent partner for as long as you need to. How long were you a silent partner, Brother Burzens? About four months? He went out with me 
once or twice a week. And, you know, we went out a lot. He went out very consistently for like four months. And look at him now. You know, and you know what? It's okay. As far as I'm concerned, it's okay if you're a silent partner for one year, two years, five years. Be a silent partner as long as you want. You know, but what I'm saying is that if you want to get out there and start talking and, and being a talker, that's great. Don't, don't, be, don't be intimidated like you have to know all the answers to every question. If people ask you a question you don't know the answer to, just blow them off. Or just blow off the question. Say, well, I'm trying to talk about something, you know, uh, different. We can come back to that. And uh, let me just focus on what I'm showing you right now. And then when they want to come back to it, it's like, hey, I got to go. You know, see how <laughs> You know, and then, you know, once you get totally done, okay, let's get back to that. To answer your question, I don't know. You know, there's no shame. You know, look, I've been a Christian now for over 30 years, and people come up to me and ask me questions, and I say, I don't know, because I don't know everything. There's no shame in not knowing the answer to a question. And you know what? I've been out soul winning with people who didn't know the Bible that well, and they ran into one of these false teachers, and that false teacher just destroyed all their arguments and just chewed them up and spit them out. But did that make the false teacher right? Did that make the guy I was soul winning with wrong? No. See, the guy who wins a debate is just whoever's the smartest guy who's, who's the quickest to think on his feet. That's why I don't like debates. Debates don't determine truth. Truth is truth. And so the soul winner is right. The, the false religion's wrong. You're not always going to win every argument. The goal is not to win. We're not going out argument winning. Amen. We're going out soul winning. Amen. Right? We're going out pit polling. We're not going out there, Amen. you know, uh, just trying to show that we can spar mentally with people and, and do a better job. That's not what it's about. Okay, so let's talk about the Catholics, okay? Because that's something you're going to deal with a lot. And Catholics are some of the easiest people to win the Lord, thank God. How many of you here are former Catholics? Put up your hand if you've ever been a Catholic. Yeah, look around. A lot of people have been Catholic, and they've gotten saved. So this is a great mission field, is winning Catholics to the Lord, getting them out of that false religion. Here's what I do different with the Catholics. I do everything the same, but I add one step at the end. And here's why I add this one step. Catholics can sometimes tend to just go along with you and pray the prayer without realizing that they're actually changing what they believe, maybe. Because Catholics have been taught to repeat prayers. So they might just repeat a prayer just like, oh yeah, I repeat prayers all the time. Maybe this can, you know, shave a little time off my sentence in purgatory or whatever. <laughs> so a lot of Catholics could just chant something with you, or they could just be polite and friendly and go along with you. So I want to make sure that doesn't happen when I'm dealing with Catholics because I know that they tend to be that way sometimes. So here's what I do with Catholics. I get to the very end when I'm doing my wrap-up, right, and I'm asking the questions. Well, after I ask my last questions, right before I pray with them, this is where I would insert this, right before I pray with them, this is what I say. Now, you mentioned that you were Catholic, right? Or you mentioned you went to Saint so-and-so the church. Now, let me just tell you, the Catholic Church teaches something completely different than what I showed you today. They teach that you actually do have to go to church. You do have to do works. You have to confess your sins to the priest. You have to take the sacrament. They teach that faith is not enough to save you, but that you have to do all these other things. But I showed you from the Bible how it's all by faith. So which one do you believe? Right? Which one do you believe? So I, 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 I want to make sure they know we're not just adding this on to your Catholic religion. We're not just pouring a little new wine into your old bottle. No, we're giving you new wine and a new bottle. And so we say to them, you know, hey, you mentioned you're Catholic. Here's what the Catholic Church teaches. Here's what you just saw from the Bible. Which one do you believe? Now, a lot of times at that point, even though they've been with you up to that point, a lot of times you'll get to that point and here's what they'll say. Well, you know, I, I'm going to stick with the, the church. I'm going to stick with the Catholic church. Or I, I still believe, you know, the Roman Catholic religion and, you know, Mary plays a role or whatever. You know, th they'll just start telling you how they're going to stick with being Catholic. But if the person actually understood and believed what you preached to them, here's what they'll say. 
you'll say, which one do you believe? And they'll say, well, I believe what the Bible says. Amen. That it's by faith. I'm going to go with what the Bible says. Yeah. And then at that point, you say, okay, well, listen, let me pray with you before I go. And then, boom, you lead them to the Lord. That way you're not just going around praying with a bunch of Catholics that aren't really getting saved. You want to make sure that they understand that we're not just adding this on. This isn't just like a little add-on to Catholicism. This is something different, okay? So that's the thing that I do with Catholics. How about atheists? And I know this is one that really trips people up. I've been out soul winning with someone, and as soon as the person says, well, I'm an atheist, they froze up. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to handle that. And I had one guy that I was with just say, okay, well, see you later. You know, this is like, he didn't know what to do next. And you don't, you know, what are you going to ask him? Hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? They just told you they're an atheist. They have no interest. But listen, I'm going to tell you a method that I've used to successfully lead atheists to the Lord. I've seen this work multiple times. Now, this method is not original with me. I learned this when I was at Howells Anderson College, and I've successfully used it since then, and I've gotten atheists safe. Here's what I say to the atheist. I say to them, let's just pretend for the next 10 minutes that there is a God and that the Bible's true. Just let's just pretend. I know you don't believe that, but let's pretend that the Bible's true. And then I'm going to show you what the Bible says about being saved, heaven and hell. And then at the end, you can decide whether you believe it or not. That way I'm not getting into some argument about the existence of God, some creation debate. You know, I, I want to talk about the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So I just say, hey, let's just pretend. And then that way I'll get three or four minutes into my gospel presentation. And then they say, well, I don't believe that. I say, wait a minute, we're pretending. <laughs> and then they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, all right, let's keep, you know, stay in character. We're pretending here. Look, I've seen it work. Not only have I had a lot of atheists listen to the gospel, I've actually had some of them get saved using that method. Wow. Now, here is the way that I get them to agree with it. Or, uh, excuse me. Here's the way that I get them to agree to this pretend. What do atheists have in common? They all have a very high view of themselves and especially with how smart they are. They think they're very smart, don't they? They're very intelligent people. <laughs> And so I kind of appeal to their pseudo-intellectualism by saying to them, because I say, hey, let's just pretend that the Bible's true for like 10 minutes. I'm going to show you what the Bible says, and then you can decide whether or not you believe it. But at least this way you can see what you're rejecting. And the way that I get them to agree with it is I say this. I say, well, even as an atheist, you must believe that the Bible is one of the most influential books in the world. I mean, 2.3 billion people claim to believe in it. You know, 3.9 billion people claim to believe in Jesus. So this is a pretty influential book. It's the best-selling book in the world. So as an educated person, you should know what the Bible says, right, just to have a, a, a knowledge of the world that we live in. And I've had some of them say, yeah, that's true, you know. Just show me what it says. So you kind of appeal to their idea of themselves being very educated and say, well, you know, let me just teach you something. I mean, you like, you obviously like to learn things. You're a college student after all. <laughs> Even though I know that college students probably don't like learning things and probably aren't like, but that, you know, you're kind of just giving them a, a compliment and saying, hey, you like to learn things. You know, this is, I mean, this is a super influential book. You don't have to like it. You don't have to believe in it, but you got to admit it's pretty important, you know, as a piece of literature. And then I teach them and then let the Holy Spirit and the power of God work on them through the gospel, through the preaching of the gospel. You know what? Don't be surprised if, if you get an atheist saved because the gospel has power. It has power. It will cut to the heart just as it did in the book of Acts. Atheist. How about Jews? Believe it or not, Pastor Anderson has successfully won Jews to Christ. <laughs> Man, the old IFB just kind of sat up a little straighter. You know, if they're watching this DVD and they're kind of on the edge of their seat, they got their pen and paper out like, oh, I got to win the Jews to the Lord, you know what I mean? Because that's, that's all they want to talk about, right? So, you know, oh, how do we do it? I won more Jews to the Lord on accident than they did on purpose. No, I'm just joking. But anyway, the, you know, how do you win the Jews to the Lord? 
You're going to love this. Here's how you win the Jews of the Lord. Romans Road. Yeah. New Testament. Yeah. You say, oh, we got to go to Isaiah 53. Yeah. Why? They don't believe in the book of Isaiah. Oh, take them to Deuteronomy. They don't believe in Deuteronomy. If they would have believed Moses, then they would have believed Christ. He said, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. Do you believe that or not? They don't believe in Genesis and Isaiah any more than they believe in Romans. So you might as well take them to Romans because those are your clearest verses. You don't have to go to Ecclesiastes and show them there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not as an alternative to Romans 3.23 because they don't believe it any more or less than anything else. And you know the funniest part about it is the vast majority of Jews don't even believe that Isaiah even wrote Isaiah 53. Talk to Jews. Talk to rabbis. You know what they'll tell you? They'll tell you it's a totally different author of chapters 40 through, through 66. You know, the, they'll say there's two Isaiahs, they'll tell you, if you talk to the Jews. Because this is why. Chapters 1 through 39 of the book of Isaiah are very different than chapters 40 through 66. I'm sure you've noticed that. Why? Be, you know, and it's kind of like an Old Testament of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters. And then the 27 chapters are kind of like a New Testament of Isaiah. And what's interesting about that is that the Jews will say, oh, well, this is another guy who wrote 40 through 66. It's a different guy pretending to be Isaiah is what they claim. When in reality, it's all written by Isaiah, amen? amen. It's just two different stages of the book of Isaiah. There is a major gear change between chapter 39 and chapter 40. But, but the funny thing about it is, you, you know, these, these Zionist types will get all excited about showing a Jew Isaiah 53. They don't know that that Jew is thinking in the back of his head, that's not even the real Isaiah. That's pseudepigrapha of a guy pretending to be like Isaiah. And you say, well, I'll show him from the beginning of Isaiah. They don't believe that either. <laughs> Okay? They don't believe any of it. They don't believe the Bible. Okay, so what's going to win the Jew to Christ? How are we going to get Jews saved? You know how we're going to get Jews saved? The gospel. You say, show them a sign. How about the sign of the prophet Jonah? Because the son of man was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Hey, that's what they need. You know what they need to hear? The death burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's, it. that's a sign that's given unto them. That's their sign. So I knock on the door of somebody who says that they're Jewish. They're super unreceptive. Usually they won't even give you the time of day. Usually they're hostile. They hate the Lord. But sometimes you'll get Jews to listen to the gospel. I've had it happen many times. And when you get a Jew to listen to the gospel, you say, all right, turn to Romans 3.23. They go, I don't believe the New Testament. Okay, that's okay. Let's pretend. Let me show you what it says. <laughs> Why? Because the Jews and the atheists are very similar. They both hate the Lord. Okay. But you know what? Jews are not all reprobates. There are Jews that will get saved. I mean, in Christ's day, Jews got saved. I believe all throughout history, Jews have gotten saved. I've seen some of them get saved. I baptized a Jew less than a year ago at Faithful Word Baptist Church. At, at our hate group, you know, down in Tempe, we baptized a Jew less than a year ago. So, so how do you like that? Okay. Now, I'm out of time, but let me say this. Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. Okay. Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists, I just use a standard plan of salvation. I don't do anything different with them. And, and any kind of a non-Christian background, you know, Hindus, Buddhists, Eastern religion, Islam... I just handle those the exact same way. I just go through the plan of salvation. The only thing I would emphasize at the end is just that, hey, you have to reject Islam in order to receive Christ as Savior. You have to reject Hinduism. You have to reject Buddhism just to make sure they don't think that they can be both Buddhist and a Christian or both Muslim and a Christian, both Hindu and Christian. So that's the only thing I would do with them is just really drive that in at the end that hey you got to make a choice here sort of like with the catholics which one do you believe which one is it choose life and then the last point i want to make is just a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject Amen. 
If you show someone a clear scripture and they balk at it, you show them a second clear scripture and they balk at it, hey, have a great day, see you later. And leave on a good note, leave on a friendly note, smile and, and be nice. Why? Because hopefully somebody will be back six months, a year, two years, and knock that door again. So you don't want to poison the well for the next person. All right. God bless you. Thanks for coming to this conference. Stick around for more preaching. I'm taking off, but there's more great stuff to come. God bless you. Yeah.